nothing really backs me off. That's the kind of thing I love to do. The crazier, the better. I like to follow the path and find the inconsistencies and find the problems, find the things that don't work. And then I point that out to a lot of people like, okay, this tool is literally being used by like five people. and It's not connected to anything. Is it worth our time? And then I feel really happy that I'm able to cut the fat, as they say, like save us money, especially right now in this market. I work with a lot of vendors and I, I can be loyal to specific vendors, but at the end of the game, it's what is best for the business. So if there's something I've used before that I love, but no one else really sees value, I have no problem telling them, hey, you know, I'm sorry, we're, we're gonna have to cut this contract. Welcome to the Distributed Truth Podcast. Today's B2B SaaS teams all share one thing in common, fragmented customer data. Marketing, sales, customer success, finance, and product teams need better approaches to unified customer data. What does it look like to be data-driven rather than data-inhibited? What is the link between investing in unified customer data and revenue growth? How can we create consistent customer experiences through unified customer data? Join us here at the Distributed Truth Podcast as we interview a wide array of go-to-market revenue operations, technology, and data leaders, all dedicated to solving the problem of fragmented customer data. Hello and welcome to the Distributed Truth Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Evan Dunn, and here with me is Kat. Welcome, Kat. Thank you. Appreciate you inviting me. Kat is a Senior Revenue Operations Manager at Weights and Biases, previously at Supermove, small startup, and Zoom. You might have heard of it. Um, Kat, you just started with Weights and Biases Tell us a bit about what Weights and Biases is. It's weird there's an ampersand in their name, but, you know, more power to them. Makes it stick out. And then a bit about uh, what you're doing starting off there. Sure. So Weights and Biases is an ML ops um, platform. It's geared towards AI companies that need some, something to be able to test their AI product, um, look at reports, regression tests, deployments. It's kind of like almost like a CRM, but specifically for like developers who are working on the AI. And my role, <clears throat> kind of a jack of all trades. Um, I focus on territory and data management, but I'm also um, there for any projects that the team is working on um, because of my background being like a business analyst and working with all the different types of go-to-market um, tool, um, people, departments. So you are ops for ops. I'm I'm like the extra person if you need someone's other like experience and um, input and help. Perfect. And uh, ML ops. So it's a CRM for algorithms, if you will, little machine learning records. Yeah. Instead of moving a person through a funnel, you're moving a, an algorithm through a funnel. Is that do I have that? Analogy. Yeah. So, so like if an AI company is creating a self-driving car and it needs to be able to know when there's a person in front of them instead of like a signpost or even just differentiating between the two, it, you can put it through these tests um, to see if it, if it recognizes that that's a person. And so it sees the picture and it can say, okay, yeah, that's a person. So these test cases that you can run your product through, is just a way of tracking it and making sure that it actually is going to do the job that you're selling to people that it's going to do. Yeah. Uh, there's like a 99% chance someone listening to this has heard about AI uh, and probably even works on an AI product probably in their free time these days. Uh, when should a company take a look at weights and biases? Anytime. We have a free PLG motion so people can go online and download it and use it for free. Um, it, it is limited by the amount of users for the freemium. Of course, if you're an enterprise company and you need you know, a bunch of people to use it or you need uh, more robust model modeling, then yeah, you'd want to do the paid version for sure. But we have a freemium version. You, you know, there's no risk involved. You sign up, you just start using the product and see if it actually helps you out. Nice. Uh, I'm now I'm just picturing how I would build like a social listening query for weights and biases that would actually filter to weights and biases, this company. But 
more to the point. Um, you're, you're new to your role there, Kat. Um, what did you think about coming in? Like what frameworks and, and priorities are top of mind for you when you start out at a new company as a revenue operations manager? Well, the first thing I want to do when I start at a new company is um, focus on documentation that's already created because it's fast. It's the fastest way to learn what's going on in the business. If there is no documentation, then I try to gather all of the systems, anything that we are subscribed to <clears throat> or purchased, just to know like where people are at, what what is being used, what's the main CRM, where is the, the customer data flowing through. Um, from that, I build flow graphs. So I, I, my, that's how my brain works. My brain organizes, it sees like a pile of Legos and it knows that it can build a house out of it or, or a boat or whatever. Um, so I put these visuals uh, together, not just for myself, but also for the rest of the team. Um, that way they understand that, okay, our data from Salesforce is flowing into our data lake and then it's being pushed back. And these are the fields that it's touching. And this is how often it gets updated. And that way we, we know if our reports are correct or the analytics are correct. And, um, you know, when you have people who have been there for a while, you can ask them and they usually just have it in their head, like a program. They don't have it written down. So that's, that's where I would come in is I would just have them explain to me that I'd be jotting down notes and then putting that process down on paper and just like, Hey, is this, is this how it is? Is this way? Oh yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And then we're able to get everybody on the same page. That way nobody has this secret sauce that they're holding to themselves and everybody knows what's going on. Yeah, I actually see a lot of those types of diagrams. Actually, do you want to give a shout out to your favorite diagramming tool? Is it Miro or Lucid or? Uh, Lucid Chart by far is my favorite, but I use whatever I am like able to that the company provides. Right now, I've been using Freeform. That's I think it's a Mac product. I'm not entirely sure, but we don't have a license to Lucid, so. It's like, as long as I can create boxes and with text and arrows, I'm good. <laughs> and, and describe for me how deep this documentation goes. You know, one, I'm a big fan of the approach and a lot of other people on our podcast have talked about something similar around the customer journey and then down to the data layer and the integration pathways. You mentioned, you know, when there's no documentation, you find the systems, right? First, do we have a system? Second, what data does it have? Not just the record level or entity level, but down to the field level. Yep. That can become quite the rabbit hole, right? Like how do you yep. present this in a way that you and others can come back to? So it's a very high level visual first, something that literally has like a box that says Salesforce and an arrow pointing down to another box, like it goes into Zendesk. Or, you know, you start at the top of the funnel. So you always start with the website is usually what the top of the funnel is. And when someone goes on your website and they click a contact us form, what is it going through? Do you have a marketing automation platform? Does it go instead to your data lake? And so with the very high level boxes and arrows, it gives enough of a story for everybody at the company to understand where our customer data is flowing. Um, the only time I go down into the weeds is if I'm working with an, an, an analytics or uh, like data science type people that need to really crunch the numbers and know. And by then it becomes a much bigger project with all of us together um, because data dictionaries are a beast and they're never an easy project. I, I, I've seen a lot of these diagrams and often, you know, Working with Syncery, we come into a company and um, the more diagrammed and documented, the easier it is to um, deploy and onboard because we're essentially replicating their cross-system data model into Syncery, right? Now, often what I see is that there is some sort of flow diagram, right? Yeah. Um but at some point, and I think this is tied to like company size and, and age of the company, right? For how many systems and pathways mm -hmm. exist, right? Like how well traveled, <laughs> you know, because the someone gets blocked with an initiative. So they spin up a microservice or an API or, you oh, know, yeah. uh, people get creative, right? 
I feel like looking at a lot of these, I feel like many people would just back off when they see these spider web nightmare scenario stacks, right? Like what keeps you going to peel back the layers and find better pathways? And how often does documenting turn into actually we need a new solution or we need a different approach? Well, I actually give quite a lot of credit to, so when a company is starting up, um, they actually do a pretty good job of connecting or finding a single source of truth area. But I'd say the larger the companies, the, that's where it becomes a spider web of, of insanity. Um, nothing really backs me off. That's the kind of thing I love to do. Um, the crazier, the better. I like to follow the path and find the inconsistencies and find the problems, find the things that don't work. And then I point that out to a lot of people like, okay, this tool is literally being used by like five people. and It's not connected to anything. Is it worth our time? And then I feel really like happy that I'm able to like cut the fat, as they say, like save us money, especially right now in this market. Um, I work with a lot of vendors and I, uh, I can be loyal to specific vendors, but at the end of the game, it's, it's, you know, what is best for the business. So if there's something I've used before that I love, but no one else really sees value, I have no problem telling them, Hey, you know, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to have to cut this contract. And they call that the cat cut. (laughs) Vendors that know me, they will tell you I'm very straight to the point. (laughs) No, I think that's important, right? I mean, you're talking about the adoption problem is is um, a huge hurdle to overcome. And if it's not overcome, it's in the best interest of vendor and um, company to often, you know, find different ways. I'm curious when you're doing that evaluation of the flows and pathways, like what do you find is the biggest pain? Is it the latency issues, the lag time between like... It goes here, it comes back, it's too slow or it's too hard to track timings. It's getting enriched one way and another. Is it uh, complexity of the fields and records or is it duplicative fields and information? Like what what is the most common um, oversight, if you will, in integration pathways? Well, to be honest, um I, and this is not really system related, it's more company related, but customer, the customer support is what I find. Mm -hmm. The um, strength of a a tool that's integrated is as good as the person who's integrating it. And a lot of times that is because the customer success team is either fantastic at uh, onboarding you to using the tool properly, or they're horrible at it. And the tool is, is being basic is it's used not to its fullest potential. And so a lot of tools I've seen, I've used brand new vendors that are just come onto the market over, you know, vendors who have been around forever, as I call them dinosaurs, because their customer success team uh, doesn't care. Sometimes they just, oh, we have the money. We have a lot of customers. So why should we uh, give you specific um, time, especially if you work at a smaller company like at Zoom? We were given prioritized customer success because we're considered an enterprise account, but at much smaller companies, you don't get that. And so that to me, I say is the biggest sticking point uh, for a tool that is being used accurately and integrated correctly. Um, Can I read that back to you a little bit? Yeah. So, so you're saying that because you're saying that the CS quality of um, vendors is the biggest issue and like it's either the biggest gain or the biggest loss Yes. Um, in your experience. And I imagine that's because integrations always have issues. Yes. And you're not going to be, I have been around the block a few times, so I know what to look for, but not a lot of people have had the benefit of that. You know, if this is their first startup or, uh, maybe this is their first ops job. They're coming from sales or what have you. Not everybody has the background experience to be able to be like, okay, I'm going to now install this application. This is what I need to look for. So see the CS team is very valuable for the success of the product they're selling. 
Um, and I look for that when someone's selling a new product to me, I instantly look to see how I, how the salesperson interacts with me and my team. And then, you know, then obviously I look at the product itself or to see if it's even going to be useful. Um, but if they're not good to me, then I don't care how good that product is. I see it as a problem. No, that makes sense. I actually uh, want to give a shout out to Sinker ECS team, onboarding team, which is renowned. It's actually the, like the top thing in our reviews is is the quality of our onboarding team. But I, I can I resonate with what you're saying too, partly because uh, even in tools that I find intuitive to learn, there's still corners. And I, I'm not even managing integrations typically, but um, my learnings here definitely suggest that there's always issues and there's always fixes, right? Like if a CS team is readily available, they can actually build you a workaround and it's probably in their best interest to do so, even if that's five hours on a smaller company, because that might be the thing that you end up shopping around for, right? Exactly. Um, is a, a certain field that you needed or a, a certain um, uh, timing that, that you needed. Um, so shifting gears a bit, um, how do you think about, um, data along the customer journey, right? So you've got a lot of systems you, you work with and manage, uh, uh, from marketing automation, CS, CRM, finance. I'm not exactly sure what you manage at, at weights and biases, but just in your experience, because at, at Zoom, you were marketing systems, right? Um, yeah. and previously you were sales data and systems. So you've seen a lot of different, uh, systems and stacks, um, how often in your experience working with different teams and different stacks, do companies have a sense of the full journey from a data standpoint pinned down like a, a customer 360, but it's even more than that, the bow tie, if you will, yeah. um, where they you feel like they're, they can comfortably track from lead to customer to renewal? That is actually a very rare thing that mm. companies are able to provide. And that is a lot of the time um, because they did not start with uh, someone like from a data science background or someone who has extreme systems uh, integration experience. And so uh, a lot of these systems are not connected in any way. Um, so that it's very hard, very difficult for anybody to pin down that full 360 journey. And so that's, that's why that's the number one thing I do is when I look at, when I join a company, I ask for all the systems and I ask how they're connected because I want to see, okay, are we missing on, you know, how many activities that, that, or how many times they visit our website or, you know, are we able to track any of that? And, uh, and it's super important because when you get to companies that are huge and you have to backtrack, it becomes a big project and a headache. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And, uh, uh, the, the larger the company, wouldn't you agree, the less figured out this actually is, because I think the systems get away from those who manage them faster than, um, uh, than people are able to build that unification, um, to keep up, right? Like it, you might be onboarding maybe five to 15 systems a year, and those actually exponentially relate uh, in terms of uh, number of pathways, right, that are, that are needed. Um, is there a particular team that uh, has not or that has seen the benefit of attempts at, at sync and integration the least between marketing, sales, CS, finance, um, huh, I would say, I don't think there is any team that doesn't benefit from that. Being able to see the full journey is extremely important for all the teams, um, whether they know it or not. And maybe the engineering team would, would be least likely to benefit from it because they're building the product. So they don't really need to see um, the product team for sure will need to see, but the engineering team behind that, they probably are the ones that least benefit from knowing. Otherwise, I'd say everybody benefits from having mm -hmm. that connection and seeing the full 360 customer journey. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's often, uh, product is often viewed as sort of external to go to market. But if you think about 
customer facing groups within an organization, product is right there, right? Oh, they, they should be hand in hand with um, CS and with sales. They need to, you know, if we're losing sales because uh, integration is not possible with this product, product should be right there knowing to put that on the roadmap as a high priority item to fix and improve. Um, the product team should definitely be right there understanding what the gaps are. Yeah. Yeah. What metrics and, and things do you think product leaders should track? I could think of, you know, churn generally, but like how, how should a, a product leader sit down with sales and CS to actually uh, execute on what you just described? It's better if they sit with ops because ops are the ones that are pulling all those reports. Although CS and sales can paint a picture for them, they won't be able to like pinpoint unless they're also efficient or they have dashboards and ports already created. But things like closed one or sorry, closed lost reasons, um, they can see if it's product related, then they can double down on figuring that out um, or closed one reasons even. This product is really easy to do to use. It's really user friendly. That's something that they know they shouldn't change that. Um, churn reasons are really important too. Like maybe their pre-live churn because implementation of the product was just horrendous and took months. So that, you know, means that your product is really difficult to understand from the get-go. You can't even get it started. Um yeah, I mean, they don't really need to speak with inbound uh, leads coming in. Uh, that's more of a website thing, you know, like make it look beautiful marketing. But yeah, definitely those would be the biggest points I would say product would need to know about. Yeah. Um, wh one last question for you, Kat. Um, appreciate your time and your thoughts. And you've clearly got a ton of experience with your Zoom background um, and, you know, moving from big companies to small companies. But RevOps is becoming this big deal, right? When likes to reference the stat, it was like the top growing link, LinkedIn job for a bit there yeah. last year. Oh, yeah. um, and you didn't have a RevOps title until recently, right? Like, you, mm -hmm. so you moved from systems and data and CRM admin titles into this. What are like? Why is RevOps becoming a big deal? One, two part question. I'm cheating, and two. <laughs> um, how can, could, would you encourage RevOps leaders to think about, um, the data layer as vital like you do, right. To, um, managing the customer life cycle. So obviously my own opinion, I think the RevOps function is becoming more important because of the market that we're in right now. Um, before you can get away with having um, separate departments funding for separate departments, the sales ops, the marketing ops, even a CS ops. Um, even that though was also problematic because you'd be working almost in silos. People wouldn't talk to each other. So it's twofold reasons why I think it's becoming bigger. One is because of the market, because of these layoffs, because we need uh, companies are trying to, you know, get these, uh, these jack of all trade people that, you know, they could hire at a rate instead of hiring five different people that do different areas of what that person can do. And two, to break these silos that naturally occur when you have a sales ops and a marketing ops and a CS ops and different teams. Um, it, it can be very difficult to stay on the same page of what projects are happening it, unless you have one leader that sits over all three departments. So that's why I think RevOps has, is growing in major popularity is folks are thinking more strategically. And um, the second question, I believe, was why is it important for them to focus on the data layer? Sorry, can you repeat the second question? Yeah, so I see a lot of RevOps leaders come into these roles and focus on enablement and processes, very much sales ops uh, type frameworks or marketing ops. Um, but there are very few, it seems more and more, but, but few who focus, uh, as a first place starting point, right. On, on the integrations, the data layer. Um, and I, I can think of why that's important, but how would you persuade the RevOps world to follow you in the focal point you have on, you know, 
managing the customer lifecycle, the customer journey requires knowledge of the systems and integrations at play. Well, uh, that's a really easy way to convince you go to the top and what do they care about? They care about revenue. So if you're unable to, to report on accurate revenue because of all of these systems that don't talk to each other, so you can't follow the money, then yeah, uh, the higher ups are going to be kind of mad about that. In my, in my perception is very easy to persuade why that's important um, when it when it relates to what's important to them, which is always revenue. Um, for a lot of you know operations reasons, it's it's for the data governance and data integrity and being able to see the whole world of what a customer is going through to make it easy. But when it comes down to it, it's all about the money. It's all about the money. I mean, revenue is in the word revenue ops word in the title. I'm, yes. It's Friday. We're recording. It's the weekend. Um, Kat, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, you know, I appreciate you spending the time with us after you just started this new role at uh, Weights and Biases. If you're building an AI product, go check out Weights and Biases. They have a PLG motion. If you're not familiar with PLG motion, that means a free trial, but you probably are if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> quite familiar with PLG motions. Um, yeah, Kat, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Evan. Thank you for listening to the Distributed Truth Podcast. Check out our other episodes or visit Syncary.com to learn more about unified customer data. That's S-Y-N-C-A-R-I, Syncary.com. Thank you. Have a great day.